Deliverance Temple today, leading up into the Easter uh, celebration or the resurrection celebration. This is, starts what they call Holy Week. So this week starts what we call uh, Holy Week, moving on from Palm Sunday, going down to Good Friday, and then resurrection on Sunday morning. And so in uh, keeping with that theme, I'm going to have them roll a video for us uh, in the back. said in this world you will have tribulation but be of good cheer i have overcome the world and we thank god for our king let us bow our heads and we're going to move right into the word of god for this mor morning dear gracious heavenly father god we thank you for what it means for you to come as the king and god we accept you whatever way you've come we have no preconceived notions of what you want to do in our lives, God, we yield our will to yours. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And for that, we're grateful. And one thing we have learned and understood, your will is always best. Now, God, we ask that you would bless this preaching moment, God, that you would encourage us, touch us, and give us what we need. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Let the people say amen. amen. Come on with your Bibles in your hands. Repeat after me. This is, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I will have what it says I will have. I'm a part of Deliverance Temple where we love by living our vision every day. We connect with our Creator continually. We confess our deliverance consistently. We, our consistently. we commit to serve creatively. We, commit to serve creatively. we communicate Christ's love compassionately. Christ's love Father, God, Father God, feed me your word. Feed me your word. If you believe you're going to be fed, go ahead and make some noise this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. I do that every time, but that is you setting your expectation that I didn't just come here and log in, tune in, come through the doors for nothing. My coming should not be in vain. I ought to be fed. I ought to get something from the Lord. Amen. God is a feeder, and I am a receiver. Yeah. All right, so we're going to cover, go back and cover what we've been in since this month started. So let's go ahead and bring up this first thing on the screen uh, March equals Women's Month, which is something I didn't quite understand until I uh, did some study about International Women's Day, which is March the 8th. I'm not understanding that March has become Women's Month down throughout history. And so because of that, 
uh, I begin to do some study and then spiritually it began to take me into this series. And so the series has simply been this, the book of Esther series. And so I've been enjoying preaching the first two sermons so far. And so the first one was I got a good man. And that was observations from Ep Esther chapter one. And we studied King Xerxes and Queen Vashti and we studied her relationship their relationship and what's interesting in February I'll, sometimes because of Valentine's Day I like to talk about relationships just never got a chance to end up going in another direction and thought well I'm not for sure when I'll get to it and then God had me do it in March and so it was good to study what relationships look like and so then we transitioned from that to last week's sermon which was called the favorite and we were talking about the favor of God. And so that was observations from Esther chapter 2. And so what we learned there is, this is a summation of it, is Hadassah being raised by Mordecai and finding favor as Queen Esther. And so we took quite a bit of time to talk about that. And so today, this is going to be the third installment. And today's uh, title is called, I Saw the King. I saw the king. Somebody say that with me. Say, I, I saw, the king. saw the king. And so today we're going to do observations from Esther chapters 3 and 4. And so we don't have time to do the full chapters of each. And so we're going to be borrowing things from both of them to give us and paint the picture that I need to paint. And so somebody may say, but we were in Palm Sunday. And so what are you going to do with that? And... I'll get to that. I'm, on a, I'm not going to go totally off of the Palm Sunday idea, but I've just been in this Esther thing, and it's just been blessing me, and hopefully it's been blessing you. And so I want to stay in this vein, and then we'll, we'll try to get into the Palm Sunday if we can. Let's pick it up with Esther chapter 3, verse 1. Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted Haman, son of Hamadith, Hamedatha, the Agathite, the Agite, over all the other nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. And so we, we, we're picking this up in chapter three. We close chapter two where Esther becomes queen, but we didn't finish all of chapter two. There was a little bit more at the end of chapter two that talks about this man named Haman. But when you get to chapter three, it says this guy got promoted. And so last week we were talking about favor and so the favor of God fell on Hadassah, who was also known as Esther, and she began to be elevated to the queen. But now there's this different guy who was also being promoted. And the first thing I want to share with you, which is not in the notes, just because a person is promoted doesn't mean God promoted them. Promotion comes true, and real promotion comes from above. But Satan is a perverter and a twister. So oftentimes he will promote people that have no business being promoted because he tries to see what God does and he tries to beat him to the punch or he tries to do a, a counteract to what God has done. So Esther was raised up by the hand of God and here comes Satan raising up this guy named Haman. He became very powerful in the empire. Let's look at verse 5 through 6. And this is explain what I'm talking about. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He was filled with rage. And so once this guy got a, a position, he wanted everybody to bow down and to kiss his feet. That's how you know that God did not promote them because he didn't have the right attitude. And I told people years ago on my job, I said, my nose don't get any browner. And what that means is I will not be kissing up under nobody. You may be the boss. You may be the CEO. But there's only so far I will go with that because you put your pants on two legs at a time as well as I do. Now, in this building, you have authority over me. But if I ain't too say, catch me outside of here, you'll find another Another mentality. It, it, it's, it's a bad spirit when somebody gets promoted. They want everybody to bow down to them. Now, Mordecai, being a Jew, 
and being of the children of Israel, he understood there was one God and you worship that one God alone. And so Mordecai was not of the predisposition that I'm going to be bowing down to you. But when Haman saw it and what happened was people snitched on Mordecai and when Haman found out he was filled with rage. Let's move on and put this verse up here. This is the sixth verse. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality, so he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. Remember, we talked about it in the first uh, part of the series that his empire covered 127 provinces, and he was trying to grow it. It covered all the way from India to Ethiopia, and so Haman with his evil self, didn't just be offended by Mordecai not bowing down to him. He said, not only do I want to punish Mordecai, but his entire family, his entire heritage throughout the entire empire. And that brings me to point number one, and it is this. When you mix ego with evil, that's a recipe for disaster. We all have a little bit of ego. There's nothing wrong with having a little bit of pride and celebration in who you are. But when you mix ego with evil, it's a recipe for disaster. And the problem when the devil promotes people, they have ego and they also have evil. Yes. They, they, they get a little beyond the pale. They go too far. Sometimes you can tell that a person is evil by the way that they talk, by how they treat people, how they speak about people, how they share what is going on with people. It's, it's, it's an evil disposition that wants to put their foot on somebody's neck. Here's the thing. If I have been promoted, especially if God promoted me, he will keep me on top. I don't have to step on somebody to stay on top. All right, let's move on. Let's look at verse Three, eight through nine. Then Haman approached King Xerxes and said, there's a certain race of people scattered throughout all the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. He said there's a certain people. So now this Haman who has a lot of power, he goes directly to the king and he wants to talk about Mordecai's people. And he's like, these people are different. Let's read. Their laws are different from those of any other people, and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So it is not in the king's interest to let them live. Now he ought, he's talking about annihilating them. Now, he's exaggerating, and he's saying these people, they don't, they don't obey nothing. You know, when, when a person wants to put their foot on your neck, they'll find all kinds of ways to devalue you, even if they have to lie on you and lie about you. Now, the Israelites, they had their own law, but they knew how to work within the system. But they were going to celebrate the Sabbath. They were going to do what they were going to do. And it had not been a problem until Haman got offended. Yes. Another thing, this is not in the notes, but you have to be careful with folk who have an ego who get offended. Because when people get offended, they'll find a way to make up anything about you to make sure that you lose your position or lose your job or lose your money. Or lose your relationship. If they got to lie, they lie. If they got to cheat, they cheat. If they got to steal, they'll steal. Because their ego has been bruised or offended. Let's go to another verse here. If it please the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed. And I will give 10,000 large sacks of silver to the government administrators to be deposited in the royal treasury. If it pleased the king, go ahead and wipe them out and I will donate to your campaign. I'll give 10,000 sacks of silver. I, I will pony up a lot of money. So that brings me to point number two. And here's something you need to understand, especially if the favor of God is on your life. 
Difference intimidates weak-minded people. I don't like you because you're different from me. I don't like you because you get up and go to church on Sunday morning while I stay and drink and have my beers and watch television. Do what you want to do, but why does what I'm doing bother and irritate you? Because the favor of God on my life, yes, I'm different, but I'm not going to apologize for my difference. And so here's the thing. Haman was bothered by their difference. Because when you're evil, what happens is people who walk in purity, it irritates you. People who function different irritate you. If you are a one-woman man and I'm a 12-girl player, it bothers me that you move different than I do. You think you're better than me. No, you think I'm better than you. And now you're bothered at me because you are so weak Minded, weak-minded people can't handle difference. There's something called DEI, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we have politicians now trying to strip those departments away because, and let me just be honest, in this contract, context, the American patriarchal context, the only person that's supposed to be on top is the white male. If there's anything different, they get a little bothered and worried and concerned. But this America is bigger than just a few folk. It's supposed to be the land of the free and the home of the brave. And if my people had to fight for this land, you can't tell me we can't be on top too. Some, some, some years ago, I had a young white male. Not sure what that was. that was. That was one of our saints calling me. Don't you know I'm preaching? <laughs> of, of, all, of all the times to call, this ain't the right time. But anyway, I, I had a, a, a young white male talking to me about, because I, I, I like to listen. I like to talk to people. And we were talking about the political Seen, especially after Obama got into office. And it was interesting. Once you put a black man in office, boy, it irritated some folk. And so this man was saying uh, how now the most discriminated person in America is the white male. And he was really irritated. And he was telling me about how they're discriminated. And so I listened to him. And after he got done talking, I said, so let me say you are absolutely 100% correct. Let me go ahead and agree with you. Let's say that you are 100% correct. My problem that I have with you is the fact that now that you feel like you're discriminated against, what you should be saying is, oh, now I understand how everybody else feels, and now I should work with you. But instead, your feeling is, I need to steal power back to get it back to where I'm on top. So this is a bad mentality that doesn't want to share power, doesn't want to share everything. Some people are trained, I got to be on top, and everybody else can fend for themselves. It's a bad spirit. Let's move on to point number three. Point number three says this, only pure hatred makes you want to destroy someone over difference. It's one thing to recognize difference, but Haman said, I want all of them gone. Not just Mordecai, who's offended me, but kill them all. And that's where we get the spirit of racism that says you're different from me, and it's not okay for you to be different from me, but now I need to kill you, wipe you out. I need to take you out. I may not want my child to date your child, but instead of me sucking it up and moving on, I'm going to burn a cross in your yard. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to hang you from trees. And that's an evil spirit. And it just didn't happen in the civil rights era in America. It's been happening throughout time. And it doesn't just happen with white versus black. It's happened with black versus black. It's happened with black versus white. It's happened with male versus female, female versus female. The human experience, if we are not locked into God, it's amazing how low we will go. 
Sister Michelle Obama said, when they go low, you go high. Lady Devin told me that. I was telling her something. She was like, Andre, when they go low, you go high. I said, I feel like going low today. You know? <laughs> I feel like going high. But it's something about our human nature. If we're not careful, we don't mind snuffing people out. Now, I know you're saying, Pastor, I'm saved, sanctified, so I don't do that. I don't kill people. I know the Bible says thou should not kill. No, you've never murdered anybody, but you murder people with your mouth. You'll kill people with your tongue. You'll dog somebody out just because you got offended, just because you got nervous. Look at her thinking she's so fine. She is fine. We all know she's fine. Ain't no need you get an attitude about it and, and talking about her. Learn how to love people. But our human mindset, if you're different from me, I automatically don't like you. I don't like Darlene's dress. Yes, you do. She just wore it different than what you would have wore, and you got offended. I don't like Sister Ruth. Yes, you do. She just has a few pounds less around her waist than you do, and you offended and mad. So now you got to find a way to bring her down. Hey, I ain't talking about worldly folk. I'm talking about church folk do this stuff too. We got we to gotta work on it. We don't want to have the spirit of Haman. Let's... Continue to read. Let's look at Esther 3, 10 through 11. The king agreed, confirming his decision by removing his signet ring from his finger and giving it to Haman, son of Hamath, Hamadatha, the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. What bothers me is the king, he didn't even think about it. Yeah, that's it. let's do it. Let's go to the, this next verse. The king said, the money and the people are both yours to do with as you see fit. This game brings me to point number four. This is so simple here. Point number four is this. Weak leaders empower bad ideas. It's, it's, it's bad when you put a weak leader at the top because you can give them a bad idea and attach money to it. And they were like, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, a lot of us have been under bad laws because somebody put some money on the book somewhere and they was like, yeah, let's do it. You know one of the main reasons why we can't get gun control in America? The most violent country in the world, have the most mass shootings in the world. We say we are the most developed economy in the world and we have the most mass shootings. You know why? because there's something called the National Rifle Association and they lobby in politics and they give money. And so there are politicians who will never vote what they may really believe because it's too economically beneficial for them to keep voting the wrong way. Ooh, I don't mean to get all political, but all the way up to the Supreme Court. We got a Supreme Court official who looks like us named Clarence Thomas, but many times he votes against us because he has a billionaire that pays for his vacation and pays for his kids' college and does things. This is a sick, wicked, twisted system, but it, is, it didn't just start with America. It's been happening throughout time, and the folk who have the dollars, they control the rules even when the rules are bad. Now, while I'm picking out people, normally I wouldn't pick out people, but I'm doing it today. While I'm doing all this picking out the people, I need to make sure me as the pastor, I don't, I don't empower bad ideas to the highest tither. Right. Oh, you give the most, so we're going to do what you say. No, I want to follow God, whether it, it, it right or wrong, right should always be high. And let me be honest, right don't always pay the most. Sometimes you got to struggle when you do right. I've seen preachers do stuff I know was wrong and have more money than me, have a bigger congregation than me. But at the end of the day, I know when we both die, I answer to God. And so I would rather do it right than do it wrong. Let's, let's keep on reading. Let's look at verses 13 through 15. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children. My God, 
Haman got upset with Mordecai, but now there's a law is to kill them all. Women and children. It used to be a time, even in organized crime, even the mafia would say, leave the women and the children alone. But when you are in evil, kill everything. That's real evil. Let's keep on going. In one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. And we don't want you to waste all time doing it. We want you to do it in a day. We set up one day for everybody to be killed. All right? Let's read. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. Ready for that day. In other words, they were saying they wanted the other people in the land to carry it out. They want, so now this is a plan that was plotted between this high official and the king, but guess who they wanted to carry it out was the regular folk. And this is why I don't uh, get too caught up in the whole racial thing because some of the people who are being racist, they don't know that they're being controlled by people higher than them. There's some folk that don't like me because of the color of my skin, but they don't know no better. They've been taught not to like somebody different than them. And as long as, and I've said it before, they know as long as they keep poor folk fighting, poor whites, poor blacks, poor Latinos, then the wealthy folk can go on and do what they want to do. But when the poor folks start coming together yeah. and start realizing, do you realize the trailer park and the ghetto ain't that far from each other? Poverty make us all act the same. And then once you see that, and that's when, when, you, when you live in a, a place like Muncie, you'll see folk from all colors. When you broke, you just broke. You learn how to get together. The crack era and the crack epidemic and the opioid epidemic, it didn't put us all on the same playing field. I grew up in a time when it was the Muncieana homes. You didn't see people from different colors. But once drugs hit the land, you see anybody. Because life can get on all of us. But the beauty of that is we can start raising everybody up together. That means all the poor people, if we reach them, we can start revolutionizing their life. And we can be like what Martin Luther King said. The little black boys and the little white boys could come together and be making a difference. That's what we want to happen. But the evil spirit of the enemy, which the scripture says the enemy of the Jews for us, is the enemy wants nothing more than see division. And so we got to fight against division. We got to love our fellow man. We got to be ready for our fellow man. And don't get tricked into fighting your fellow man because they're different. Now, let me talk to some of us black people. It is true. That some of the folk that you mad at didn't do nothing to you. Some of these young white people growing up, they didn't put no cross in your yard. They trying to make it like you trying to make it. Stop fighting and come together. And what's so powerful, I'm, uh, I, I'm bothered that the church couldn't get it together. But what's so powerful, hip hop was able to do what the church couldn't do. Hip hop was able to cross into the land and little white Boys and girls were playing music from the ghetto and hollering run DMC and hollering public enemy fight the power and NWA if you know what that means NWA and it was white people that was enjoying NWA the hip hop nation brought people together and the church is still fighting. Boy, I wonder how frustrated God gives his people and Malcolm X said it and it still bears. Uh, repeating several decades after he said, he said the most segregated time in America is Sunday morning in church. And it still goes on. Right? At some point, we're going to break it big because of what's been done to us. But we got to learn how to celebrate difference and stop fighting things and see what God can do. Now, I believe we are coming. We're coming to an era where people are starting to drop some stuff. People are starting to let go of some stuff. I know some folk that was racist until the mixed grandbabies showed up. It's something about kids that'll make you change what you was taught. 
and change what you thought. And you start realizing all oh, them folk ain't as bad as I was told. Because love will conquer. Love will cover. And that's why we're a church that tries to preach the love of God. That'll go beyond difference. Now let me get a little deeper for you because we understand the whole racism thing. Let me, let, let me, let me plug a little deeper. I ain't going to go too far. I'm going to back off of it, but I'm going to plug a little deeper. Now we're living in a day where there is the gay and the transgender and the alphabet and all of that. Church folk, we're going to have to learn how to love folk. And let me throw this out there too. They're tired of hearing love the sinner and hate the sin. Because y'all don't know how to do the difference. A lot of times y'all hate everybody, talk about everybody. So stop instead of talking about folk, just learn how to love people where they are. You may not understand it, you may not feel it, but love people where they are and let God make up the difference. The church ought to be a safe place for whatever you're struggling with. The church ought to be a safe place. All right, let's move on. Just want to touch on it a little bit. It says the, right, the couriers. Let's go back to it. Yeah, right there. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. With their egotistical, sedity selves, they sat down and they drank it. Ooh, let me, let me throw this out. Did you know sometimes the judge, the prosecutor, and the public defender all go out drinking after they engage somebody 50 years and throwing the key away of people and and if you have powder cocaine, you only slap you on the wrist. But if you have rock cocaine, we'll lock you up for the rest of your life, ravaging whole communities. And then they go to the bar and drink and laugh. Do you know how wicked the system can be? And so the whole land is thrown in confusion and Haman exercises. They just sit up there drinking. Mm, let's put this up. Point number five. Poor leaders don't care that their decisions create chaos and confusion. Don't even care. And I normally wouldn't do this, but I'm in rare form today. Let me, let, let me say this. On January 6th, there was a fella that didn't care what was going on in the Capitol. They were begging him to say something and do something. Knowing his words had incited violence, he didn't care because he was bothered that he lost the election. It wasn't stolen. You lost it. And didn't care. They had to force him to say something. And I'm not just trying to dog him, but people when they're in power and they're egotistical, they don't care if they cause confusion and chaos. That's why you can't make no man, no woman your hero because they'll let you down. Put that point back up. I want to say it again so it sinks in well. Poor leaders don't care that their decisions create chaos and confusion. Now, me as a leader, sometimes I can go ahead and do things, but when I do something that causes trouble, I always try to let y'all know or at least apologize. I just, we decided we want to do something uh, with the baptismal pool, and because of that, we're doing some work, and it affected the TV screens. I ain't got to tell y'all that. Y'all can just come here and figure it out while you're here. But I'm a leader. I want you to know what's going on. If you're going to sow into this ministry when something's going on, you need to know about it. I try to tell you. If you show up one day in the parking lot, you can't park, well, just get here if you can. Or if we can't go online, well, where you should have been here. No, I need to go ahead and tell you, if, it, if anything causes confusion and chaos, a real leader cares. And the problem is we've been around too many poor leaders. And here's another problem. A lot of times you don't know how to celebrate a good leader until you've been under a bad leader. 
And some of y'all, especially in this ministry, you had Bishop Clark, Bishop Mitchell, and now me. So you really ain't been under real bad leadership. But if some of y'all want to, go ahead and go somewhere for a little while. You'll be back. <laughs> yes, sir. East Esther 4. Now we're going from 3 to 4. Let's go to Esther 4. When Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes and put on burlap and ashes and went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. Now look at the difference. Xerxes and Haman, they drinking. Mordecai understands at the end of the day, it is the hatred of me that's affecting my entire community. And so he began to go into mourning. Let's continue to read. Oh, let, let me stop for a second. Some of us saints, I, I'm worried about some of us saints because things can happen in our community and it don't bother us. Because we say, well, they need to be saved. The Bible says, hell, 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 shut up and pray for folk. Amen. Well, did you hear about the mass shooting that happened at the end of the back to Muncie? Well, they should have been out. Part, part. It's not about what shouldn't have been done. Whenever loss has happened, it ought to affect you as a saint of God. It bothered me because I was there. I was there on the ground. I was there praying, but I asked myself, did I pray hard enough? Did I say something that I was bothered? But God said, if you hadn't prayed, more people would have died. Had you not been on the ground, more issues would have happened. So I, but I wrestled with it because I don't want to be a person who is unaffected by what the community goes through. I don't want to be, because I got a new car, I can't be concerned about somebody walking. There's times that I'm driving and I'm on my way to work and I cannot stop to pick somebody up. I've seen people on the side of the road. I got to get where I'm trying to go, but I pray for those people. God, send an ambulance. God, help them. God, this. God, that. I still care. And if you say it and you don't care, I wonder what's going on with your salvation. And sometimes, many of us, especially if you have an intercessional anointing, you care too much. There are times that I've woke up and there's nothing going wrong in my life. My family is good. My money is good. My health is good. My body is good. Everything's going good and I feel bad. Just feel off. And I'm praying. I'm thinking, what's going on? And I'm talking about just feel bad. And many times, tragedies around the corner. I, then I get a call. Something happens like, God, that's what it was. Me and my sister have talked about it. Sometimes you wake up, especially if you have a prophetic anointing, you have just this foreboding. See, it's not just about your family. Your family may be good, but somebody else's family may be struggling. And here's another thing I know. A lot of y'all come to church, you smile and you praise, but on the inside, you're struggling. And you can't tell anybody. You can't talk to anybody. I ought to be a type of pastor that can feel your pain. The Bible says Jesus felt the infirmities of the people. He was the king of kings. But he, he went through things because he cared for the people. And my mother is working on raising up some intercessors here. We need intercessors that care about what's going on with the hearts of the people. Not just when we know about it. But there's some stuff you don't know about it. But your discernment says something's off. Yeah. You ever had somebody smile at you. But you can see through the smile. And see pain in their eyes. You got to know how to take that thing to the Lord. Yeah. What, what was the songwriter that said. Oh what, what grief we are often forfeit. Oh what needless pains we bear. All because we do not carry it everything to the Lord in prayer. And some of y'all only pray about y'all. You only pray about your stuff. And that's why well, God will never ask my prayers because he's tired of you talking about you. If you would pray for them, he will work on you, but you can't get out of you to pray for somebody else. All right, let's go on. He went as far as the gate of the palace. For no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing clothes of mourning. He came all the way up to the political arena. He got as close as he could get. Some of y'all need to go close to the jail. Go close to the city court. 
and just walk around and pray just in case. Read some more. And as news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was great mourning among the Jews. They fasted, wept, and wailed, and many people lay in burlap and ashes. Oh, I, I, I don't like what's going on, but I like what's going on. They, they, they were in mourning, but they went to fasting. They went to praying. Some of us, especially those of us who haven't grown up in the church and know about a praying church, whenever we get in trouble, we turn to the addiction. We turn to Facebook. We run to everybody. But let me tell you something. When you know the Lord and you don't have nothing going on and it looks like life is being ripped from you, you, don't, you learn how to turn to the Lord. You learn how to fast and pray. You learn how to give it all you got. That's going to bring me to point number six. And we've been sharing it already. Real leaders carry a burden for the plight of the people. Fasting and turning their plates down. Sometimes it's not time to party. I love a good vacation, but it ain't time to go on vacation all the time. I love some window shopping therapy. I, I love some retail therapy. I love to get on Amazon and start pulling some stuff into my cart. But listen, there's a time for everything. And sometimes it's not a spending season, partying season, vacation season. Sometimes it's a praying season. It's a moaning season. It's a fasting season. It's a reading season. And a lot of times you're not just praying for you, but you're praying for folk that's going through. You're praying for the city. If my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive the sins and I'll heal their land. Well, I got to go to Atlanta because it ain't nothing in Muncie. The reason why it ain't nothing in Muncie because there's not enough saints praying in Muncie. The Bible says he'll heal the land if the folk would get on their places and pray. Now, I love a season where I can vacate and pray at the same time. Because sometimes God will let you go. But when I go and I'm looking at the ocean, I'm still talking to God. God, I ask that you would keep the plane in the sky. Not just my plane, but the other plane. God, I ask that you would bless the folk next to me who party and hard. God, these spring breakers return them home safe so their mama won't have to cry. You got to learn how to take a prayer everywhere you go. Yeah. Esther 4 verse 4, moving right along. When Queen Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was deeply distressed. She sent clothing to him to replace the burlap, but he refused it. Now she was in a position of power. And she was trying to take care of her cousin, her mentor, her step-in father, but he refused. And that leads me to point number seven. Point number seven is courageous leaders know comfort can be an enemy to progress. Do you know Martin Luther King? There were times they told him, if you do this, they're going to lock you up. He said, I would rather be uncomfortable than be comforted and my people still going through. So lock me up. Put me up. Do you understand? They telling him, you may not need to go there. But he said, I didn't see the mountaintop. I didn't see the other side. And we about to be free at last. Free at last. But when he got up on the balcony, a sniper took him out. He probably could have still been living if he wanted to be comfortable. Yeah. But courageous leaders, they don't care about comfort. When it's an enemy to progress. Could I be doing something else with my time? Could, do I necessarily have to be working a job and pastoring? No. But courageous leaders say, listen, I'll wait for the blessing. If my blessing don't come till I get to heaven, I'd rather serve God courageously. And when they tag my TOE, when they bury me six feet under, let them say that was a man that served God. That was a man that served his community. That was a man that communicated Christ's love compassionately. That was a man that even though he worked all night, if I needed him, he would come and 
would stop by my house. He would pray for me. He would preach to me because courageous leaders don't care about comfort as the number one thing. Oh, some of y'all parents know. Parents, you could have had more. You could have driven better. You could have lived better. But you had them babies. You put stuff out for your babies. You could have went. Some of y'all single women, you could have went on dates. But you didn't trust nobody to be with your baby. So I stayed home so I can rub this snotty-nosed Negro I got at home. Because I love these babies. And sometimes you don't worry about comfort. Because courage is greater than comfort. Sacrifice. We don't like them words. Sacrifice. Cost. And a lot of us, a lot of y'all, I'm preaching to the choir. Y'all know about cost. You've been through. Some of y'all that got kids locked up in jail. And you've been down to the courthouse. And you've been down to put money on the books. You've been down talking to them behind bars. Now all they friends that got them to do what they need to do, they don't show up. They don't put money on the books. They don't call. They don't visit. But mama and grandma and auntie and Uncle Joe, they show up because courage is greater than comfort, especially when progress is involved. Oh, let, me, let me back off of that. Let me just talk about students. You can't get the degree and you party every weekend. That's one thing I figured out. I had a 3.6 grade average. Well, shoot, I'm good. But that 3.6 started dropping because I was getting comfortable. I like being comfortable, but comfort can lull you to sleep. Comfort can get you stuck. Comfort is like the tortoise and the hare, the rabbit and the turtle. The rabbit is faster than the turtle. The rabbit should have made it to the finish line, but the rabbit got too comfortable. And went and took him a nap because I'm ahead. I'm ahead. Listen, let me tell you something. There's some, there's some folk right now that are on the bottom and you on the top, but you done got comfortable. There's some business owners that done got too comfortable. And you're going to have a new business person going to come up and rise above you. Oh, why they think her chicken is better. It's not that her chicken is better, but she come to work. When I come to your business, I can't even get no chicken. I don't know when you're going to be open. Your hours say from 11 to 2. I show up at 12 and you already gone for the day. But the next person who's coming, they're struggling, but they're trying to make it. And don't be mad when they pass you by because you got too comfortable. Let me preach to your church folk. There are going to be some folk coming off the street that's going to get saved, that's going to jump right over you because you done got too comfortable. We don't know if you're going to come to church or not, but when folk really get delivered, you ain't got to ask them. They'll be out there before the door even opens up, but some folk done got too comfortable. You're preaching, Andre. I know I'm trying. Easter, I mean, Esther 4 and 5, let's keep on going. Then Esther sent for Hattach, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed as her attendant. She ordered him to go to Mordecai and find out what was troubling him and why he was in mourning. I love a woman. A woman sometimes, they, 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 they want to investigate. He, I, I try to comfort him and he refused. Let's find out what's going on with Mordecai. Let's keep on going. Let's look at verses 7 and 8. Mordecai told him the whole story, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai started singing, telling it all. Sometimes you need to tell it all. Well, I ain't no snitch, but sometimes you need to tell it all. Read. Mordecai gave Hattach a copy of the decree issued in Susa that called for the death of all Jews. He asked Hattach to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. Next verse. He also asked Hattach to direct her to go to the king to beg for mercy and plead for her people. I ain't too proud to beg. To beg. Let's look at point number eight. 
Point number eight, strong leaders come with both receipts and a plan. He, he, he pulled out the law. You give me a copy of the law. I, I'm, this ain't time to come with no hearsay. I want to show you I got receipts for what's going on. And not only do I have receipts, I got a plan. Go beg, Esther, because we is in some trouble. Some of you people, y'all, y'all, and now, now I know sometimes you don't always want to tell everything, but sometimes you just got to tell it. Well, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. Quit lying. Tell me I'm about to lose my mind. I don't know if I'm going to make it. And I got receipts to prove it. And I need you to go beg God for me. I, 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 I need you to help me out. I think I see Brother John Hampton back there. He would call me sometime. He's like, I don't know what's going on, but God don't seem to be answering my prayers. But he answered yours. So this is what I need you to ask for me. In other words, I ain't scared to say I'm having trouble getting a breakthrough. I need some help. Call in some reinforcement. Hook a brother up if you can. Verse 10 and 12. Then Esther told Hatach to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. Read. All the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die. In other words, this ain't the safest thing that you were asking me to do. Read. Unless the king holds out his gold scepter and the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days. Mm -hmm. Read. So Hatach gave Esther's message to Mordecai. Point nine, let me put this up here. Some leaders can only see the obstacles and not the possibilities. Esther was like, do you really know what you're asking of me? Because I haven't been sent for by the king for at least a month. I can't just show up unless he sent for me because I could lose my life if I show up out of time. I'm going to go to verse 13. I'm going to read this. It says this, just to give mother a break. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment. That because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. Mordecai said, don't forget who you are. Some of y'all, you get so high, you forget where you came from. At the end of the day, you still got this blood. And don't think you're going to get out of it just because you got the crown on your head. Verse 14 says this. For if you keep silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. I want you to know if you don't step up, don't think you're the only one that can do something because God will raise somebody else to do the job that he put you in. So I'm telling you because God favored you and elevated you and promoted you. But if you forget who you are, don't think that God only has to speak through you and use you and work through you. Because one monkey don't stop the show. If God get ready, he'll make a backslider do it. He'll make a baby do it. Out of the mouth of babes, God has ordained praise. I'm trying to get you, Deliverance Temple, to do it. But if you go by the wayside, God got other avenues. I need you to understand you will not escape, Esther. Like Mordecai, he wasn't playing. And here it goes. Go ahead and read this part, Mother Mitchell. Put, put it up. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. It's a possibility, Esther, that you are promoted not to be with the king. You are promoted not just to be in the mansion. You are promoted not just to get a degree, but for such a time as this. I actually promoted you because I need you to make a difference for somebody else. Your blessing ain't about you. Your anointing ain't about you. Your degree ain't about you. Your wedding ain't about you. So don't get caught up in your car. 
Don't get caught up in your money. Don't get caught up in your education because God strategically puts you in a place for such a time as this. Point number 10, wise mentors know timing is everything. Oh, you could have been born in a cotton field. You could have been born in a the, back in the 1500s in France. Why would you say the 1500s in France? Because in the 1500s in France, they had a whole bunch of sickness going on. It began to spread throughout Europe. And finally, somebody figured out that the reason why we're getting sick is because we defecate in the same water that we use to wash and drink. And that's how they created the sewer system because they did it by trial and error. You could have been born in those times, but you were born in the 21st century. You were born in the age of information and technology. You were born in the time where you can put a post on Facebook and reach a thousand people at one time. Maybe you were brought to the kingdom for the time as this. So baby, get off of Facebook and twerking and get the word of God and begin to change somebody's life. Begin to do something important. Oh, I'm just little old me. You're not just little old me. You could have been born a slave. You could have died in your mother's womb. But you made it through the birthing canal. You came out and oxygen hit your lungs. You are somebody, but you done got too comfortable. Yeah. And so here was Esther comfortable in her position. Let's look at these next verses. Then Let's Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. Ah, oh, baby girl, that's the cult of revelation. She said, gladiators, mount up. I need some folk to pray for me. I, I understand what I got to do. I, I understand I got to step up to the plate, but I can't do this by myself. I'm going to call the praises and the prayer warriors. I'm going to call somebody to fast on my behalf. I'm calling somebody to anoint my head with oil. I'm ready to do this thing, but I'm going to need some help. Baby, I got something I got to do, but deliver simple. I need some prayers. I need somebody praying for me, and you may not be able to eat this week. You may not be able to eat this hour. You may have to turn back your plate. But we're getting ready to do something major. So let's look at this next verse. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Let me pause right there. I deliver me from people that want you to fast for them, and they won't fast. Mm -hmm. No, we in this together. Yes. Read. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. This is where we get the statement, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to see the king. And that's why the title of today's message is, I saw the king. I, I took a chance. I took a leap of faith. I took a step. I'm going. It may hurt me, but I'm going. I may have to cry, but I'm going. I may be depressed, but I'm going. I may still be grieving, but I'm going. I may be mourning, but I'm going. I'm going to go. It may hurt me. It may cost me everything, but this is the time I got to take a chance. Got to go. Here is point number 11. Esther realized timing is everything and prayer can change anything. First, she was thinking, I, I, I can't do this. But when Mordecai said, maybe you were here for such a time as this, she realized that she's like, all we need to do is put some prayer on this thing. But not, not just me prayer, but we prayer. We, 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 we need to have a prayer meeting. And I'm calling a prayer meeting. Back in the day, you used to call a prayer meeting. You have to come to the church. I don't need you to come here, but I'm calling the prayer meeting. When you're in your car, I need you praying. Yeah. When you're on the job, I need you praying. When you're in the shower, I need you praying. When you're in the garden, I need you praying. When you're walking in the mall, I need you praying. Because we're working on something. We, we put power together. We're like the Power Rangers, the pink and the yellow and the black and the blue. When they come together, something major can happen. All right, got to get us out of here, but put this up real quick. So what in the world, this got to do with palm 
Sunday. It don't have anything to do with it, but God showed me how to make it work. Let's, let, let me do this. I'm going to uh, switch from Esther, and I'm going to read these verses to you. And then we're going to close. Let me read these verses. John 12, 12 through 16. Go ahead, put it up there in the back. The next day, we're jumping all the way into the New Testament in, in Jesus' time. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it was written. Fear not, daughter Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Here we go, the last verse. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. So Pastor Andre, what in the world does Esther have to do with Palm Sunday? Let me make it make sense for you. Point number 12. Through faith, Esther faced death to go see the king. But through love, our king faced death to come see about us. Hallelujah. See, Esther had to go see the king. But Palm Sunday is the king came to us. Yeah. And I need you to understand the reason that you're going to be praying and worshiping because the king done already came. I don't have to go see him. The Bible says you don't have to go to the heaven to pull him down. You don't have to go to the ground to pull him up. But the Bible says the word is nigh thee. It's in your mouth. If I want to see the king, all I got to say is Jesus come. Mary's baby show up. All I got to do is say Jehovah come and see about me. I heard Sister Ruth talk about the names of the Lord. Well, Jesus is inside my mouth. I don't have to worry about perishing because he already perished for me. Yeah. And that's why I can say. Not I'm going to see the king. I can say, I saw the king. I saw the king. Last point. Come on, stand to our feet. Glory. I cry Hosanna too because I saw the king. I didn't have to go see him like Esther because he came to see about me. He came on an old rugged cross. The king came even though I was messed up in sin. But he came through 42 generations. He came in a manger wrapped in swallowing clothes. Oh, but he got up out the manger and he came as the king to you and I. Yeah. And next week, we're going to talk about how he went to the tomb. I ain't going to get ahead of myself. But guess what? I can praise him because I saw the king. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear gracious heavenly father, thank you for the faith of Esther, the faith of Mordecai, that stamped out the hatred of Haman and the, the weakness of the leader called Xerxes. But God, I'm so grateful that I'm not under Xerxes and Haman. I'm under the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'm so grateful that I saw the king. Now, Father God, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice that does not know you in the part of their sins and they can't say that they saw you, I pray that they would just pray these words. Say, King of Kings, come into my heart, come into my life. You died for my sins to take me from zero to hero, and I accept it all. King, come. King, come. Hosanna. In Jesus' name, Jesus. Amen. amen and amen. Come on, put your hands together. Clap for the Lord. All right. God bless you. We will go and we will fellowship together on Palm Sunday. Those of you online, have a wonderful week.